huzzah deliciousness Welcome to another video. My name is Heather, and as always, I'm reading with a vengeance, and I hope you are too. Big love going out to all you OGs who keep coming back. And if you're new to my channel, very warm welcome to you. I hope you're all doing very well. How is everybody's reading doing? We're almost to the end of September, I guess. Yes, we are. And I'm here to talk to you about the books that I have read in the first half of September. But first, let's see what's been going on since my last video. Really not a whole lot. I mean, just winding down from when my mom had visited. She left at the beginning of September. And since then, I think my husband and I are trying to eke out the last of the summer, even though it doesn't get incredibly cold here. We're trying to do as much as we can to make summer last. And what we've been doing is we have been getting day passes to hotel pools and just spend the day at a pool. They usually have a bar right there in the pool, not in the pool, but in the pool area. Because it is the end of summer and because we both have Mondays off, going on a weekday, we would have this whole pool area to ourselves. And it has been so much fun. I'll pop in a couple of pictures. I posted a couple of pictures on my Instagram of caught reading. But yeah, we just go and read by the pool and swim and listen to music and order drinks and order food. And it was just a really kind of fun staycation, day staycation. <laughs> so that's really the, all that's been going on here. I hope you all have enjoyed your summer and are gearing up for autumn. I guess depending on what the climate is in your area, that means different things to different people. But to me, fall is all about just kind of the calm before the storm that is the holiday season. And I like to cozy up in a corner with a good cup of coffee or tea or hot chocolate and read. I just love the whole fall vibe. This will be our first fall here in Savannah. So I will be interested to see how that vibe manifests itself here. But let's get to talking about the books that I read in the first half of September. I actually read quite a wide range. What I have been trying to do is really kind of balance between reading all the new books that I have an opportunity to get my hands on, all the arcs that I get through work, and just seeing all the new releases firsthand, working in a bookstore. And, I, I, and I've been trying to balance that with all the books that are already on my shelves, have been on my shelves for a very long time, or at least on my Goodreads TBR for a very long time. And I'm really trying to make an effort to keep those two groups balanced. And, well... All I can say is I do continue to try, but out of the eight books I'm going to talk to you about today, only two of them have been on my shelves for any length of time, but at least I got through them. And one of them ended up being my favorite so far of the month. So of course, that'll be the last one I talk about because since I don't do star ratings anymore, the way I decided to kind of handle how I talk to my, about my books is I will talk to you about the books in the order in which I enjoyed them. In other words, I start with the books I enjoyed the least and I end up with the books that I like the most. So I will start with, and this is gonna be a hot take, you guys. <laughs> Rouge by Mona Awad. I have been so looking forward to reading this book. This was just recently published either this past week or the week before. I got my hands on an arc. You guys, I DNF'd it. I'm sad to say I'm here to tell you I loved Bunny and I talk to people about it all the time and I recommend it all the time. When I saw that this was coming out, I was super excited, just like so many other people, right? I DNF'd it probably at about 62 pages. So here's the thing about Mona Awad and I and I think the fans of her her work and what I've kind of noticed, and I could be wrong, but there are like two camps of fans. There are the people who really love Bunny, and then there are the people who really loved All's Well. And I don't know if it's the order that they read them in or if they're just completely two different types of books. I have yet to meet anybody who loves both All's Well and Bunny. So the people that love Bunny didn't care so much about All's Well and vice versa. I'm finding that the people who loved All's Well love this one as well. 
So I don't know why that is the way it is. Maybe it's a coincidence. Like I said, I could be completely wrong about that theory, but I did not enjoy this book. I was bored. I didn't care. And I just didn't want to force myself through this book just because, just because of the author, you know, not every single book by an author we love is going to be a book that we love. And I have come to terms with that. <laughs> and I've mentioned before that the older I get, the more comfortable I get with DNFing. This book just wasn't for me. It's supposed to be kind of, I think, a Snow White retelling. And it delves into the brainwashing of the beauty industry and how destructive and toxic it is. And I totally appreciate all that. But the way the story is told, I just, I didn't connect with Bella. She's the main character. It opens up with her mother's funeral. Her mother is super... Uh, obsessed with beauty and her looks. Yeah, I just didn't care. I don't know how many times or ways I can say that. <laughs> if you loved All's Well, it might be something that you would enjoy, but I'm glad I got the opportunity to read it. And maybe next time for Mono Wad, just this wasn't it for me. The next book I read was Open Throat by Henry Hoke. I got this from the Libby app, but I actually read it digitally on my Kindle. I had high hopes for this one and I was a little bit disappointed. However, I am glad that I read it. So this one follows a mountain lion, unnamed mountain lion. And it's from that mountain lion's perspective. He's living up in the hills of Hollywood. You're basically hearing his perspective of humanity and the foibles of our society. There are some funny moments. There are some heartwarming moments. There are some heart aching moments. I understand what I think the author was trying to do. I just felt it was a little lacking in getting there. I loved our main character, the mountain lion. I mean, I just loved his perspective, their perspective. I, I don't even know. Um, I'm a little annoyed that it's categorized as an LGBTQ plus. Uh, there's like one line in the whole book that implies that the mountain lion is queer. I felt that that was just kind of the author's way to bring in that audience. And I thought that was kind of cheap. But other than that, I almost gave this book a higher rating on Good Goodreads than I did because of how much I love the mountain lion. And, and I think that's more about me loving animals and being empathetic to the plight of wildlife. My heart ached because you go through his escape from the mountains when there is a man-made fire that ravages where he lives and he's kind of forced down into the suburbs of LA. He hooks up with this teenage girl. And once he does that, I mean, I love that the teenage girl kind of takes him in and tries to protect him. I did not like the teenage girl other than that. <laughs> I don't want to get too far into her character. Um, and it's really not about her. I think the core of the story is just getting an other perspective, a, a non-human perspective about humans and society. I appreciate that. I just felt it was kind of on surface level. So I think there could have been more to it. There was something that happens on the very last page that is extremely satisfying. <laughs> if you know, you know. Like I said, I did like what it was trying to do. I, I felt like it could have been gone deeper. The good thing is, is it's a short book. It's only like 176 pages, very accessible. There's some really funny parts as far as how words are spelled. And speaking of that, I would encourage you to read the physical book or the digital book rather than listen to it because of he hears things, of course, phonetically, and the way it's written on the page is different. And I think that was kind of cute and funny. I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. I'm glad I read it. The next book I read was The Skull by John Classen. This book I picked up at work. I just happened to see it. It was on the independent bookstore's bestseller list. It was number one for a few weeks, and I was intrigued by it. It's marketed as a picture book, but being right at or a little more than 100 pages, I think it's a little more than that. I would call it a, an illustrated book because there are quite a few words. And not only that, it's also categorized as a middle grade and horror. So I don't think you're going to be wanting to read this to your three or four year old, especially before bedtime. I enjoyed it. I didn't quite get the, per the point of it. But let me just tell you what it's about. It is about a little girl who runs away from home. 
she runs through the forest and she come across she comes across this isolated mansion. She knocks on the door of the mansion and the head a skull without a body answers the door and talks to her. The skull head I guess skull head is repetitive, isn't it? Okay, so the skull <laughs> invites her into the mansion and they get to know each other. He takes her on a tour of the mansion and there's a couple of cute scenes where he takes her into this room and there's these cultural masks that are hanging on the wall. And the little girl asked, do you wear these masks? And he said they're for decoration purposes. And then like the next page as they're going to another room and they're walking down the stairs or whatever, they're wearing the masks. <laughs> and I thought that was really cute. The illustrations are beautiful and creepy necessarily creepy. I really loved the characters. The skull was endearing for whatever reason. And the little girl was sweet. The thing that is, is that you never find out why she runs away from home. Uh, and you never find out why he's just a skull. There, there's a hint to it, but the way that hint plays out, it didn't make any sense to me. And I don't want to give any spoilers. But other than that, I enjoyed the story. I enjoyed it just for what it was, the skull meeting this little girl and them being completely different and the skull being co totally friendly to the little girl and the little girl being very protective of the skull. You, you could tell that the skull was very lonely before and now he's got this friend. And of course, for whatever reason that the little girl ran away from home, now she, I guess this is found family. If you know John Classen, you know he's a little on the bizarre side, but he always has a solid message through his stories. And I just wasn't sure what that message was. Um, but I took from it all the things that I just explained. And yeah, I enjoyed it. The one thing that I did uh, find fascinating was at the end, there's an author's note where the author explains where this story came from. And basically, he was traveling, he went to this library to give a talk. And he read this fairy tale that was one of many in a uh, like a collection of fairy tales. And he read the fairy tale and he never stopped thinking about it. And a year passes, he's still thinking about it, but he can't remember the name of the book that the fairy tale came from. And he ended up calling the library and, and describing it to them. And the librarian, God bless them all, uh, came up with the, 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 the name of the fairy tale in the book. And so he read it again and it, he says that it was completely different than what he remembered it to be. And he thought that was very, very interesting, the way memory works, the way the brain works. What he decided to do was write this story of how he remembered that fairy tale. So it's completely different from the actual fairy tale that inspired it. It's just his interpretation and how his brain remembered it after all that time in between the first reading and the second reading. So I thought that was very interesting. Uh, so anyways, yeah, The Skull by John Classen. Yes, I would recommend it. The next book I read in the first half of September is Ford County, uh, which is a collection of short stories by John Grisham. My husband ended up buying it for me for Christmas a few Christmases ago. So this is one of the ones that has been sitting on my shelf for a couple of years. So I was glad I was able to finally get to it. I had specific reasons for adding this to my TBR. For starters, I, I love John Grisham. I will ultimately read all of his stuff. I've read most of his stuff. I specifically added this one to my TBR because quite a few of his stories uh, take place in Ford County, which I think is a fictional county. But uh, one in particular that I read called The Last Juror that I read a few years back uh, takes place in Ford County, and I absolutely loved it. It's one of my favorites. I remember listening to it, and it is superbly narrated with the accent and the slang and just the southernisms that are just delightful. So I added this to my TBR, and just one Christmas, we decided to just pick books from each other's TBR to give as gifts. And my husband surprised me with this one. So anyways, if you know me, you know that short stories aren't usually my thing. This one was okay. So far, my favorite short storyteller is Stephen King. I think he's a brilliant short storyteller. John Grisham is not bad. What I've decided makes a short story a winner for me is 
it doesn't necessarily have to have a purpose. It doesn't necessarily have to end with a bang. It doesn't necessarily have to have a whole lot of depth of plot. And I think just by definition, a short story just doesn't. But the, the characters have to be interesting and they ha there has to be some journey. There needs to be some goings on. The end doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the destination doesn't have to be incredibly interesting or jaw dropping or anything like that. I like a good story. Tell me about these characters and why they are the way they are. And the way they are needs to be interesting and needs to be different. And what they're doing and how they're going about doing it needs to be interesting. I feel like most of the stories in here did that. For instance, the first story is called Blood Drive. And it's basically about these three rednecks who get in a truck to travel several hours away to give blood to a member of their community who gets into an accident and happens to be in the hospital hours away. And stuff happens to these three hapless characters along the way. I really enjoyed that, that short story. For whatever reason, the characters were colorful, there were shenanigans, and I enjoyed it. I think there was only one story in here that I didn't really care for. It was just boring and the journey was boring and the outcome was boring. My two favorite stories in this one was called, one was called Michael's Room and the other one was called Quiet Haven and they were absolutely delicious short stories. Michael's Room is basically about a family who goes after the attorney who represented the doctor who was responsible for that family's child being severely disabled to exact revenge. It is hair raising and tense. And I really, really enjoyed that. Quiet Haven was a wonderful little story about a man who goes around to senior housing facilities and really gets at the bottom of the abuse that goes on there. And he goes about it in a way that is just delicious. I really, really enjoyed it. So for the most part, I really enjoyed this. And I think there are seven short stories in here. I think it's worth picking up if you like short stories, if you like John Grisham, if you love his colorful characters. Uh, there's plenty of those in here. So um, yeah, I would recommend this one. This next book I want to talk to you about uh, got into my hands in the most delightful way. I came into work one morning and one of the co-owners of the shop that I work at, Jessica, says, oh, Heather, I have an ARC that I think you will absolutely love. And I just love it when people come across books and then they think of me and think that I would love it. So I was completely delighted and excited. And that book that she thought of me was Lisa Unger's Christmas Presents. So this book comes out October 24th. It's a mystery thriller that happens at Christmas time. So it's not a Christmas book, but I mean, look at the cover. That's There's nothing about this book other than the word Christmas that says this is a Christmas book. So yeah, this is a mystery thriller that takes place at Christmas time. I have been trying to get to Lisa Unger's work for the longest time. I have ink and bone on my shelves and have had it on my shelves for years. I've talked about it a couple of times on a couple of videos. I have mentioned Secluded Cabin Sleep 6 a couple of times and I have not been able to get to it. Well, I was finally able to get to Lisa Unger with this book, and I'm super glad I did. I enjoyed this one. It's a novella. It's only about 250 pages long, so it's a little short slip of a book, but there's lots to enjoy in this one. So this one follows Madeline. She is a young woman who is living in a small town. She is the owner of an independent bookstore, which I love that part of the book. She's also living at home, caring for her father, who who has suffered a stroke and he was the former sheriff. Her mother is estranged and is not in the picture and it doesn't really go too deep into that. And then one day, Harley Granger comes into town. He's a podcaster. He's like a failed novelist. He becomes a podcaster, a true crime po podcaster, and he wants to get to the bottom of a mystery in the town that Madeline was a part of when she was a teenager. So when Madeline was a teenager, she had these three best friends and a new guy comes to town, Evan comes to town. And when Evan comes to town, 
things kind of go a little haywire between Madeline and her, and her little group of friends. And they all go to a party one night. And at this party, one of the girls is murdered. And then the other two girls go missing. And nobody has ever found out what happened to the two girls. And they just happen to be their sisters. And so Madeline and her best friend, who goes by the name Badger for whatever reason, uh, they're the only ones kind of left behind. They remain friends over the years. They were cleared at the time of the murder. And Evan was sent to prison for the murder of the girl. So it's, it's a decent story. It's a decent mystery. I liked the characters. I felt drawn into the story. I connected. I cared about them. I had a good time with this book. If I were to criticize anything about the book, there were a couple of things. I think the storyline with Madeline's mother could have been left out. I think it would, would have been better if she wasn't in the picture at all. I just didn't think there was that served any purpose. We never hear from Evan. This is a dual timeline. We go back and forth from the past to so when it happened to the present day. And we get a little bit from him when we meet him in the past, but he's sitting in prison in, in present day and we never hear anything really about him other than that he's in prison. Other than that, I think it's a solid mystery. I like the way it ended. I like the outcome. It makes sense. There were some edge of your seat moments. I think it was decently written. I liked that it was only 276 pages. Like I said, there's really not much to it, but there's enough to it to draw you in. I really had a good time with this book and I certainly would recommend it if you like serial killer type mystery thrillers. Absolutely. And if, if you like bad stuff that happens around the holidays, then this one could be for you. The next book I read was so bizarre, you guys. It was so weird, but I found in a pretty delicious way. And the book I'm talking about is Hurricane Girl by Marcy Dermansky. This is the first book that I read by this author. And I listened to this book and I would have to say, if you have any interest in reading this book, I would recommend the audiobook because the reviews I've read on Goodreads, uh, one of the criticisms that I've heard several people say is the, the short, like choppy sentences. And I didn't get that as I was listening to it. So I'll just put that out there. So let me tell you my experience with this book. I'm sitting there listening to it, and it's basically about this woman, Allison, and she has fled Los Angeles from her abusive producer boyfriend, and she decides to go to the other coast, to one of the Carolinas, I can't remember which, I, I can never differentiate them. She takes all of her savings, and she has sold a script, so she takes all the money from that, and she puts it all into her dream beach house uh, on the beach on one of the Carolinas, and she absolutely loves it. She loves to swim, and her love of swimming is mentioned uh, more than a few times in this book. She's in the beach house less than, I think, two weeks when a hurricane comes through and destroys it completely. She's devastated. And I thought the story was gonna, gonna go from there as far as just kind of talking about how she picks up the pieces of her life, you know, an, a failed relationship in Los Angeles, recovering and surviving abuse. I thought the story was going to be basically about surviving that. But no, it gets a little bit deeper. The hurricane is not the worst thing. The abuse from her previous relationship is not the worst thing. She's sitting there on the steps and this local news crew shows up and she gets interviewed kind of on the fly and it's just the, the news girl and the cameraman. Then later on that day, she goes into this restaurant to just get dinner and she sees the cameraman there and they he decides to buy her dinner because uh, he knows that she is down on her luck. She has nowhere to live. She has nothing. And so the cameraman is just kind of showing her a kindness and he buys her dinner and then he invites her to stay in his guest room and he comes off as very charming and likable and trustworthy. And I won't tell you too much more than that, but it takes a turn in such a way that I had to look up again on Goodreads at the genre list, you know how they have at the bottom, and there's fiction and contemporary, and I think there's another genre, and then the fourth little genre category that's on there is horror, and I'm like, 
I didn't, what? Horror? <laughs> I didn't expect what happened to happen, but it's a very small part of the book. It's, I wouldn't classify this as horror. There's just this one section that is. And then once it happens, you think the, the story's going to go this other direction you think it's going to be a survival story of another type and then it goes in a whole different direction and she ends up having a surgery a brain surgery and <laughs> this is going everywhere i oh anyways after her brain surgery that's really where the bulk of the story is it's her living her life dealing with ptsd and the effects that brain surgery will have on you she ends up having a relationship with her brain surgeon who she dated i believe briefly back in college or was it called yeah i think it was college so she's just trying to navigate through life after all of these things happen to her. And I found her interesting. I, I thought she was very relatable. I thought the decisions that she made were extremely realistic. We never know how we're going to react in different situations until it actually happens. And I just thought the way that Allison handled certain things from the very, very extreme to even just the mundane daily stuff, I think was just very realistic. So I connected with her on that level. She was a little quirky, but I found her to be just very real. If I were to offer some criticisms, there were several mentions of the fact that her dad had recently died, but they were really brief references and you don't really get into it, like what her relationship was with him, why she keeps bringing it up. And there were also several mentions of, I mean, more than several mentions of her love of swimming. And I thought with those two weird, random things that kept popping up in the story, her love of swimming and the death of her dad, I thought there would be something, there would be a connection there. There would be more to each of those things and there weren't, but it didn't take away the story for me. Other than that, I found, I found that the things that happened to Allison were incredible, but the way the story was told was incredibly believable. Um, so I really appreciated that about the writing, about the characterization of all the people involved in this story. The story was sometimes funny. It was sometimes horrific. It was sometimes heartbreaking. It was sometimes just crazy and weird. I will say where the story was at its weirdest, there are bunny vibes here. Mono Wad's bunny. Definitely vibes here. Totally different stories, totally different whatever, but there were just bunny-ish vibes here. So I'm just going to throw that out there. The ending, completely satisfying. I absolutely loved the ending. Might be an unpopular opinion. Yeah, I loved what she did there. Take that with a grain of salt. I would recommend this book. It's weird, but I enjoyed it. Or should I say, it's weird and I enjoyed it. The next book I read was recommended to me by Kristen over at Enter the Book. So thank you, Kristen. The book I'm talking about is Winter Counts by David Hesko Wanbley Wyden. This is a mystery slash crime drama that takes place on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota. You're following Virgil, who is kind of the local enforcer on the reservation when the American justice system or the tribal council doesn't handle matters in the way that the people are satisfied with. They go to Virgil to take care of matters. Virgil lives with his nephew, his teenage nephew. I think, I wanna say he's 15 or 16 years old, uh, Nathan, because his sister died, Nathan's mom. And one day Virgil is approached by a higher up in the tribal council and, and wants to hire Virgil to find out who's bringing in heroin onto the reservation. Virgil decides to initially decline that job because he feels like he would get in too far over his head until one day uh, Nathan ends up in the hospital after ODing on heroin. So it becomes personal for, Nate, uh, for Virgil to find out 
what's going on. And he ends up getting help from his ex-girlfriend who happens to be the daughter of this tribal council member. And it takes them to Denver and it gets them involved in the cartel. It's a pretty decent mystery. There are lots of snippets of Native American history, as well as the current and ongoing struggles that they face without it being kind of in your face or lecture wise or anything like that. I found that very interesting. I found this less of a mystery thriller and more of just kind of a crime drama. And then I also found that it was more of a family drama as well. And uh, I really felt like the author delved into the struggle of needing to belong. And I really appreciated that about this story. I thought this was very well written. I thought the characters were very well developed. And overall, I just thought this was a good story. I'm really glad that I found this book. So again, Kristen, thank you very much for recommending it to me. And I would read other books by this author for sure. So I would definitely recommend Winter Counts for you. And finally, the last book that I read in the first half of September ended up being my favorite. It's been on my TBR for years, and I'm so glad I finally got to it. The book I'm talking to you about is Triptych by Karen Slaughter. This is the first in the Will Trent series. And the reason that I picked it up finally is, of course, they made a television series. I can't remember what platform it's on. But it looks really good and I really want to watch it. But of course, I always want to read something before I watch it. So I picked this up and oh my God, you guys, I wish I had picked this up sooner. But I am super excited that there are so many books in the series to get to. This book was so good. It is a mystery thriller, crime thriller. Karen Slaughter has a way of writing some kind of horrific crime scenes and the things that the killers do to their victims in Karen Slaughter's books are quite graphic, but she is an outstanding writer. The mystery, the story was superb. The characters were superb. The way she writes her characters, freaking brilliant because you're going into it and you're following one character and you think that you know what that character is about. And then all of a sudden, she flips it on its head and you realize the character that you've been reading about for the last 100 pages is not who you thought they were. And she just does a brilliant job of manipulating you in the best possible way. I had such a good time with this story. So let me tell you a little bit what it's about. So Will Trent, it's the Will Trent series. And Will Trent is an investigator uh, with the Georgia Bureau of Investigations. But the story opens up, you're following Michael. And Michael is a detective with the Atlanta Police Department, I believe. This whole series, I believe, takes place in Atlanta, which was also kind of special for me now that I live in Georgia as well. Anyway, you're following Michael. He's a detective. He is investigating this murder case of a prostitute who was murdered in kind of a really grotesque way. That's how the story opens. And then you start following John, who has just been paroled from prison after serving 20 years for murdering his friend that he had in high school. And he's trying to get by on parole. He discovers that somebody has uh, stolen his identity and is using his identity to get credit cards. John decides to try to find out who is doing this and why, why they would steal his, of all people, uh, identity, a, a, an ex-con, somebody who doesn't have any credit whatsoever. So you're following these two, these two men. As Michael is further investigating this murder of the prostitute, Will Trent comes in and enters the investigation because it turns out that they there have been other women who have been murdered in a similar way. So that's why Will Trent gets involved with this case. And then Angie, Angie is another detective at the Atlanta uh, Police Department who Will knows very well. They've known each other since childhood. They are both kind of graduates of the foster system. And they bonded at a very young age. They dated for a while and they stopped dating for reasons that I won't get into. Their relationship is very, very complex. I really, really enjoyed the dynamic between Angie and Will. They're both very, very quirky characters. They have their flaws. I've read in a couple of reviews that there are people who really disliked 
Angie uh, because of her behavior. And I found her behavior completely understandable and realistic. I, I care about Angie. I think she's a good cop. I love her personality. She's snarky and sarcastic. And as far as what people think of her, Angie doesn't give a shit. She just wants to do her job, be a good cop. She cares about Will. I love Angie. I'm just going to say that. And Will is uh, super, I love his character. He is stoic and brilliant and funny, but just on a much quieter way than Angie. I enjoyed the hell out of Will. So the characters are just enough to enjoy the story, but Karen Slaughter doesn't stop there. The plot and the twists in this story, I mean, I love this so much. So I feel like I've been just kind of going every which way trying to explain this story and how much I love this book. But I hope, if nothing else, if you love a good crime thriller, this is it. If you want a good series to start, get on Will Trent because it was such a fun ride. I absolutely love Triptych. I've already put the second one, which I think is called Fractured, on hold on my Libby app. So I am in the series. I'm invested. So those are the books that I read in the first half of September. Have you read any of these books? I would love to hear your thoughts on them. What have you guys been reading in September that you want me to know about? I would love to hear about it. Or you can just say hi down in the doodly do. If you're still watching at this point, please consider giving that like button a boop and a subscribe would be wonderful. I'd really, really appreciate it. As always, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for watching and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.